associated with server-side scripting. The whole idea is, is that we can give our users a more customized web page if we can take into account a number of variables and a number of factors. For example, the user's location, which comes in the form of an IP address, which web servers can look at and determine with not a high degree of accuracy, but, but with some accuracy, the location. For example, we saw uh, last time that it knew we were in the Illyria area. It, it's not like a GPS where it knows that we're in the UP building at Lorain County Community College, but it does know that we're in the Illyria area. Now, every once in a while, servers get fooled, by the way. If, if uh, I remember when I used to be on Century for my uh, um, internet. Century has uh, uh, you know, offices in, in Louisiana as well. So um, on occasion it would tell me I was in Louisiana because probably something that the internet service provider did with reassigning IP addresses between their offices or whatever and not letting the right folks know. Somehow it, it thought I was in Louisiana. In. So it's not foolproof, but if everyone does things by the book, it should give you a fairly accurate representation. At any rate, uh, forms are a way of supplying input to the server, and the server uh, therefore doesn't have completed HTML pages. It sort of has um, shells of HTML pages and programs sort of fill in the blanks in those shells. If you notice, for example, Amazon, if you look at their pages, you know, how many products does Amazon sell? Literally in the millions. And I'm using the old-fashioned usage of the word literally, you know, where it literally means literally, all right? <laughs> millions of products on sale at Amazon. Do they have a million different pages? Of course not. They have one page that's sort of a template, and it gets filled in, you know, with uh, pieces of information that are pulled from the database based on user input and what the user clicks on and, and so on and so forth. So you notice, like, for almost every product, you know, there's a picture of the product. There's a description of the product. There's... Uh, uh, reviews of the product. There's there's customer reviews of the product. There's people that bought this also bought that for the product. So it fits a very sort of uh, standard format, um, and and sort of just the blanks get filled in. All right. Forms allow the user to give information because the request to a server consists of the URL. That would either be a web page or a script on the other end, along with the form data and along with other information, including the IP address, which can be used to uh, determine where you're at. Also, the platform you're on. You know, if you go to two different pages, or if, I'm sorry, if you go to one page that allows you to download software on a PC versus a Mac, some pages are smart enough to know that you're on a PC or a Mac and will highlight the one that you want to download. It will say, you know, here's the download of, of Komodo text editor for Mac. And if you went on a Windows machine, it would say, here it is for Windows. So that's also included in this other information. Now, thing is, is scripts get processed by the server. So they're not static pages. If they're static pages, they just get retrieved and sent down the line to the client. If they're server-side scripts, though, and these will be in PHP, ASP.NET, um, Ruby, any number of different languages, Python, The script gets processed by the server, but here's the sort of bottom line as far as this goes. 
HTML gets produced and sent back to the client regardless. All right. So these scripts effectively write HTML on the fly. So if you go to Amazon, even though there's a server-side script producing that page, it still sends back all the stuff that gets sent in a regular web page. That is HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, etc. All right. What I like to say is, you know, you don't need a recipe. Think of these scripts as recipes for the pages. The customer, the client, when they go into a sandwich shop, they want a sandwich. Now, whether that sandwich has been pre-made and is sitting there waiting for them and just needs to be delivered to them, or whether that sandwich needs to be prepared there on the spot, taking in input from the user, still what gets delivered is a sandwich. All right? So the client ultimately gets HTML regardless of what, which of these two methods are used. So, we had an example last time. We had, we sort of finished one example and we started a second. I want to review this real quickly. First example was a little search form that we had where we can type in anything we want to in the search box, click submit or search, and then it calls Bing server side script and displays the results. This is probably about as simple of a form as you could possibly have. Let's look at the elements of this form. There's a form tag that goes around everything that's going to be sent to the server. In this case, there's only one thing that gets sent to the server, and that is the search term. Well, along with the button, the button gets sent saying, hey, the button was pressed. The form tag has two attributes. Remember, attributes are always additional pieces of information that are needed. It's not enough to say I have a form. You know, who is handling the form? Who's going to get and process that data? That is the action of the form. The action of the form is the URL of the script that's going to be processing the form data. Now in our case, we're not processing it. We're letting Bing process it. So therefore, the action is the, the name of the search script from Bing. How did I get that? Just a little bit of simple reverse engineering where I did a Bing search and I looked and saw what the URL was. The method of get relates to the fact that the data is going to be passed on the, on the query string, which means that the data will be, that's being passed to the server will be visible in the URL. And if you notice, when we do that search, there we can see the data that gets passed. We can see that the query term that we were searching for was CSS, and we see that the submit button was pressed based on that. The opposite of get is post, and post sends the data in a different manner where it's not part of the URL. It sends the data in the same manner by, uh, as which like the, the IP address gets sent sort of transparent to the user. We then have a couple of input tags. Forms use um, input tags for several different things. One form of the input tag is a text box, and that's where the type equals text. Another form of the input tag is the submit button. That's where it's type equals submit. Now the name is very important here. I know that the Bing search engine is expecting the field to be called Q. 
I know that because I looked on the query string when I did a Bing search and I saw the search term was in a field called Q. So therefore that's the name I gave the text box. So that way the script would know what the search term was and be able to pull that out. The label for links certain piece of text to the ID of a form. Label for Q means that this is the label for the thing that has an ID of Q. So in this case, the name and ID, two different things. Name is what the script uses. ID is used to match up the label with the form field. Usually, frankly, what I do is I make the name and the ID the same thing. And you can do that almost all the time. Radio buttons is the one exception where you can't do that. We'll talk about why that is in a minute here. Questions on any of this? All right, the second example we had wasn't attached to any server-side script form server-side script, and that is, I don't know why IE is freaking out on this. And this is where we are just submitting back to itself. This is actually pretty common. When you get into server-side scripting, you'll see that a script will display the form and process the form. So a lot of times scripts or forms submit back to themselves. Here we have two different form controls, or actually three. We have our submit button and text box like we had before, but we also have a drop down. The drop down is a list of options. A select tag is used to define that, hey, here's a list of options. Each option has a value and then has the text of the option. The text of the option is what the user sees in the drop-down. The value is what the script sees. So this is really convenient because a lot of times in programming, you know, you need to send sort of cryptic codes, you know. In this case, you know, we send HS if it's a high school graduate or HG, or I'm sorry, HS if it's a high school student, HG if it's a high school graduate. If we simply displayed those in the drop-down, a user might not understand what HS means and what HG means. All right. Sometimes it's even more cryptic. Sometimes we send like a number code. Like maybe uh, the, the system is looking for a 1 if they're a high school student and a 2 if they're a high school graduate and a 3 if they're a college student. Well, if we simply displayed a, a, a drop-down with 1, 2, and 3 in it, the user has no idea what those numbers represent. So by being able to define text associated with the option, we can give the users something that's intelligible to them. By being able to associate a value with the option, then we give the script what it needs to do its job. All right? So in this case, the assumption is that the script needs HS for a high school student to do its job. Again, we have a label for that matches that up, so a screen reader can easily associate that. Any questions on this one? Yes? That would be on the server-side script side. That's all, yeah, that's all handled by the server-side script. You can write some code in JavaScript to handle forms as well, but typically it would be done via JavaScript or server-side scripting. Most of the time the real processing ha uh, happens on uh, server-side scripting. Some processing can happen on client-side scripting, JavaScript. So with that other class, that scripting class, well, you should be able to create a form and actually get And do something with it, right. Right. Okay, let's continue along with our next thing, which is um, 
radio buttons. Now, drop downs, whoops. By default, drop downs only allow you to have one choice. You can actually configure a drop down, though, to allow for multiple choices. And it's been so long since I've done that that I don't remember how. All right. Um, generally speaking, you want to avoid that. There's a few times where you can do that. You can also give a size on this to make it so that it displays a you know, all the options at once instead of dropping down. But this is a standard drop down. Radio buttons serve a similar purpose in that they give you a list of items to choose from. And usually, you would use drop downs where you have multiple items, or a lot of multiple items. A lot of multiple items doesn't even make sense. A lot of items, all right? And radio buttons where you have a relatively few number of choices. But you can do whatever makes sense for the for a form. Right? I mean, it, these, these are more guidelines, not cut and dried, um, um, cut and dried uh, um, rules. So a radio button also uses I forgot to close the LI here. The radio button also uses the input tag. And let's again assume that this is a form that we're going to do for um, Lorraine Community College. So let's say residency. And let's say we want to give a choice of in county, out of county, and out of state. I'm going to do it first without the label. Then I'm go I'll go in and add the label. Input type equals radio. That means it's a radio button. A radio button, again, is like the radio buttons in your car. All right? In other words, you press your second radio button, it goes off of the first station and onto your second. Radio buttons also have the idea of a label and a value associated with them for the same reason that drop downs do. In other words, if we were simply to display IC, OC, and OS, the user might not have any idea what that meant. All right? So we can put labels on them that are intelligible to the user. So we can say in county IC, out of county OC, out of state OS. Again, just like with up here where the codes are the values and the labels tell the user what those values mean. So if we look at this, Notice that the name for all of these is residency. That's what makes it act like a radio button. All right. The fact that all three of these are having the same name means that only one of them can be selected at a time. So if we bring this guy up, I pick in county, then I click out of county, notice that in county unchecked itself. Out of state unchecked it.
if I were to mess up and give these different names, then they would, they would no longer behave like a radio button. So I could click in county, and I could also click out of county, and in county stays clicked. I also click out of state. So what makes them a radio button is that they have the same name. Doesn't matter like where they are on the page. You could make a really confusing form by putting radio buttons that don't belong together next to each other on the page and you could confuse the heck out of your users if you wanted to. But of course we want to do the opposite of that. We don't want to confuse our users so we're going to put radio buttons that belong together next to each other. Now, the label's a little bit different here because remember that the label um, is associated with the ID. Now, in the other cases, we said that we could make the name and the ID the same thing. Here we can't do that because they all three share the same name. So, this is the one exception where I would need to give different IDs for these labels. Visibly, that doesn't really matter, but if a screen reader were reading it, it would associate the label with the radio button. Now, notice that our form isn't quite as neat as it used to be, right? Well, let's go and add. Let's go and add a couple of. Let's go and add a couple more things in here first. Alright. Let's go and add what the student is interested in. Alright. Then we'll, we'll go back and we'll discuss this and we'll style this a little better. So. Since they can select multiple of these, it's going to be a checkbox, not a radio button. A radio button would allow them to select only one from this group. It doesn't make sense to have a radio button that only contains one element. I've had students do that for the pizza assignment. 
And it's sort of a good thought, except the fact that once you check on it, you can't change your mind and uncheck it. You can only uncheck a radio button if there's another radio button of the same group to check. So if you tried to do uh, a, a radio button for just pepperoni, if you clicked on pepperoni, you could not change your mind. That pizza's going to have pepperoni on it. <laughs> All right? There'd have to be something else to check on. Now, you could make pepperoni yes or no, uh, and then there'd be something else to check on. All right? Or you could make all your toppings check boxes where you could check each one on and off independently. I can never remember the type for check boxes, so I'm going to Google it. It's either check or check box, and I cannot remember which. It is checkbox. And checkboxes also have a value. Usually they're like a Y or an N. Or usually they're a Y. Uh, in fact, if you ignore them, I, it, it gives the value as a Y, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to put just another one of these here, just so that we have two of these. Really wouldn't be any fun if we only had one of these. And now we have where we can check these independently. All right. Last thing that we're going to do, the last form controller we're going to look at, I think, give me a second to think, the last of the HTML4 controls that we're going to look at are te is text area. And text area is where you have uh, multiple lines. Comments being a with no limit. All right. Now, one question you might have is how could I put a limit in so that, like, for example, Twitter, you could only put 140 characters in. Uh, comments. You know, um, if you have a comment form on your website, you don't necessarily want someone typing war and peace in the comment field. You know, you want to keep it to a reasonable length. 
For that matter, how do I validate to make sure that someone has filled in their name or someone has selected their residency? That is typically done via JavaScript. We'll talk about HTML5 form controls in a few minutes here, but <coughs> remember you can't, <coughs> you can't necessarily depend on someone having an HTML5 compliant browser. Therefore, um, JavaScript is used for a lot of these things. All right, what more do we have to talk about with forms? Let's do a little bit more with styling. Let's do field sets. Let's do defaults. And let's talk about HTML5 stuff. Styling. This form kind of looks messy. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, two questions. Duh, uh, why aren't there bullet points there? And I'll bet you can answer that. I'll bet you can answer that even without asking. Let's think about it. Why aren't there bullet points there? Bullet points normally appear next to items in a uh, it, well, ordered or unordered ordered list. So since they're not appearing here, with the ordered list, they show numbers. With unordered list, it shows the bullet points. Since they're not showing in my case, what does that imply? I style them differently. So I have CSS code that takes the bullet points off. All right. So <clears throat> sort of the default answer for why doesn't something look like it normally looks or the default appearance, almost by definition, you could say, well, because of CSS. Why are those H2s bigger than those H1s? CSS. Why are those paragraphs side by side instead of stacked on top of each other? CSS. So any of those kinds of questions are always going to be answered by CSS. Now your other question, does it always need to be an unordered list? Um, always is a big word, all right? And so no, it doesn't always need to be an unordered list. But oftentimes, if you think about it, that's what a form is. It's a list of items that you're sending to a script to be processed. So it makes logical sense in most cases to do an unordered list. All right. It also provides some nice characteristic styling-wise for that. Um, that gives us sort of a hook to do some, some style things and it stacks them on top of each other vertically, which you kind of think of when you think of a form and so on. So yeah, always uh, there's not going to be too many times I'm going to say always in this class, all right? But yeah, probably most of the time. All right. Let's go and let's make this look neater, all right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the fact that that label Every one of these form fields has a label associated with it. So I'm going to say label. With. Hundred pixels. Let's see what that does for us. does absolutely nothing for us. Why does it do absolutely nothing for us? Because label is an inline tag and widths don't work with inline tags. So I have to say display inline block. All right. So sort of straightened everything out except for the, well, let's see, let's make it wider. 
There you go. That's a little bit more uh, closer to what I want. Notice how those things line up that way. Now the one oddball is this one. Also computer information systems is in two lines so maybe I'll make it a little bit wider. Alright. Now residency is off and That's because I forgot my label tags are off. Alright, that kind of does it the way I want to, except let's do this. Let's put residency on its own line. things look a lot neater, but we can make them neater still, all right? Because really, it would be nice if these were next to that. So we can say on a label, text align right. And there we get those things to line up like this. We could then center the uh, search button or submit button if we wanted to. I'm going to do that with a class of button. And then I'm going to put in my CSS a rule for buttons. Text align center. And there, it's on there. Now, I might want to put a little bit extra space there like to drop that button down a little bit. How could I do that? Margin. So, I could say margin top 30 pixels. That drops it down. So now our form is looking pretty good compared to what it looked like before. We could fiddle with that if we wanted to to get it to look um, exactly the way we wanted it to. So those labels are an example of an accessibility thing that comes in handy because remember when you're tagging things you're supplying additional information about those things. So you're saying that that's a label. When you supply that additional information you can use that to your advantage. And how can you use that to your advantage? You can style it. So the label comes in handy as far as that goes. Field sets. Notice how this sort of these sort of stick out like sore thumbs. All right. You'll see a lot of times on forms where you have groups of fields that are related. 
The most common would be if you had a shipping and a billing address. You want to purchase a product, you want it shipped to your branch office, but you want the main office billed. All right? Or like for the FAFSA form, which probably many of you have filled out. Wow, that's like a 65 page form and each for each page has like, you know, 30 fields on it and some of those fields are grouped. It makes sense when you can to group form fields together into field sets. All right. So, we could put notice that interest select all residency what we're really saying is this is a group of things, this is a group of things. So even though this isn't the best example, we use this example to implement field sets. So what I could do, for example, for interest is I could say all these checkboxes, and there could be more, certainly accounting and CISS aren't the only two programs here on campus. Would We could have a whole bunch of checkboxes for all the different programs. We could put a field set around that. All right. So how does a field set work? Well, I'm going to close my unordered list. I'm going to make a field set. I could put all the different interests in there. I could start my new unordered list. then end my field set, then start the last unordered list. I'm going to get rid of the border on the unordered list. I don't have a border around the unordered list. I have a border around the form. Okay, I'll leave that in. So notice how there's a box around that because that is a separate field set. I could make this first one a field set and just call it like general information. So let me put a field set around the first part of the form. So there's my general information, here is my interests, and then finally I have comments at the bottom. Now, it helps if I can define what the field set means. And this is where I have to look it up, because I can never remember this. legend. The legend field describes what the field set is for. And there it supplies that general info, interest select all. I could probably get rid of that then.
So the field sets are good for accessibility and they're also good for um, styling purposes so that we could style this if we wanted to um, to make general info bigger. Um, we could make all the legends bigger, for example, in a different color. So I could say legend font size 1.2 am color pound make it a shade of gray to make it stand out a little bit. Now, in our case, we might not want the border around the field sets anymore. So we could say field set border none. And that should get rid of the border. We could make a, if I was doing this for real, I'd probably make a field set for residency too, just to treat that consistently. So this has two things. Uh, it, again, the field set helps uh, people with screen readers identify what part of the form they're in. If you could imagine a form that had a bill to and a ship to address in it, if all you know is that you're in the address field, well, which address field is it? Well, the field set helps identify that. But we can also use this for sort of styling purposes as well, to style things in a different way. All right. Defaults. I can show you how to make defaults, but before we do that, let's talk about when you would use defaults. All right. When would you default a field? When do you set a default value for a field? Pardon me? Yeah, that's kind of. Okay. You could use it in that case. Yes. Okay, lottery website and a minimum age. How would a default come into play there? Okay, you could you could default to a specific value. These are all these are all good thoughts. They're a little bit different than than um, what I'm, what I'm thinking of. I guess I would choose a default if I thought that most of the people visiting the page would have that value. So, like if you look at this one, all right. Most of the people uh, visiting this page, I can't say are going to have the same name. <laughs> All right, so I'm not going to default the name to anything. Now, most people visiting this page, are they going to be high school students? Are they going to be high school graduates? Or are they going to be college students? Well, I haven't really defined exactly what this form is for, but I think it's pretty clear that, well, I don't think we can assume that. I don't think we can assume that there are any of those. Now, a drop-down in HTML has to have a value. So in the case of a drop-down, if you do not want a default, you have to put a dummy value in. So I'd have to go and do something like this and put a null value at the top and say enter level of education. All right. Because I can't, a, def uh, a drop down always has a value in HTML. Those of you that have done C sharp coding, it's possible to have a drop down that doesn't have a value. Not so in HTML. All drop downs have values. 
And if you don't specify a default, the top item is considered to be the default. So, if you have a default, generally the thing that you want to do is you want to put it at the top of your list. In general, you're probably going to, you want to organize the um, stuff in a logical order. And in this case, it seems a logical progression to go from high school student to high school graduate to college student. All right? Alphabetical would be another logical order. It also is logical if, for example, your country did most of its, or your country, your company did most of its business in North America, but did do some business in Europe, it would make sense to put United States, Canada, Mexico on the top of the drop-down list and then show the European countries after it because you're doing it based on the amount of business that your company generates. So it's best to have some logical order for this, but do keep in mind that the top item is always going to be the default unless you change it. Now you can change it, but typically it's best just to make the top element the drop down. Yes? So on like your pizza site, you could have the default where cheese is always selected because almost everybody gets cheese on pizza. Um, yes. Or you could have a default based on, you know, on size. You could, you, if you thought most people ordered large pizzas, you could do that. Now, you don't want to pick defaults just to be lazy, all right? But, again, you do it in a way that makes sense. Yes? In HTML, no. This would all be done in JavaScript, or it will be done in our HTML5 controls which we'll get to in a few minutes here. Now, residency, because, yeah, right now there's no validation at all. I could enter this as an empty form and the validation would have to be in JavaScript. Residency is one where I could probably safely say most of the students that attend Lorain County Community College live in Lorain County. I don't have the numbers, but I'm guessing that if I found the numbers, it's probably more than 50%. All right? Which means that if I don't check it, and I have JavaScript validation here that forces someone to pick it, even though 90% of the time or 80% of the time or whatever the percentage is, everyone's going to be checking in county or most of the people are going to be checking in county. So the advantage of not defining a default when there is one is that you run the, you know, you, you annoy your user. You, you have them check things that are true for most users. So you're making each user do a little bit more work than they need to. The, the disadvantage of having, uh, or what do I want to say? The issue with defining Defining a, or not defining, wait a minute, I talked about the issue of not defining a default when there is one. What about the issue of defining a default when there isn't one? So, for example, if I, let's go back and let's take this out for a second. The issue with defining a default when I know that that might not be a valid, that might not be a good default, are most of the people visiting this page high school students? Uh, I don't know. The disadvantage of that is, yeah, it's more convenient, but someone's liable to submit without changing that field. Whereas if I define a dummy value, I can force them through JavaScript to, to choose one of the three legitimate choices. So choose carefully whether you default a field or not. All right, and don't default it just because it makes your life easier. You know, default it because it makes sense for the people that are going to be using the form. HTML five form controls. Let's go to can I use. Yeah. 
HTML5 form features. This shows us the chart of the things that support and don't support. Now do keep in mind that we're still getting a lot of these sort of light greens and not too many of these dark greens. What's the difference between the two? Dark green is supported. This olive green means partial support. In fact, my eyes might be playing tricks on me, but it doesn't look like there's anything that offers full support of these. What does that mean? Well, that means that you can use them, but they're not going to work in all browsers. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, here's the interesting or the exciting or the fun part of this, is if you use a browser where the HTML5 doesn't work, HTML5 form controls don't work, they revert back to text boxes. So that's actually not a bad thing. This is called graceful degradation. In other words, it won't work completely, but it won't break either. So let's see, let's, let's look for an example of that. I'll, I'll try to open up some pages in Internet Explorer and see how they behave. So let's go to W3 Schools. And let's look for some HTML5 forms. All right, this is talking about the old school ones. Here's the HTML5 ones. Let's get to some of the fun ones. Oh, one form field I forgot to talk about is a password field. And that's where what you type in doesn't get echoed. That was available under HTML4. All right. One of the HTML5 controls is input type of number. And you can specify a minimum and maximum. So, if I type in W and submit, I get a little error message. Because that's not a number. If I type in 9 and submit, I don't, I get an error message, but if I type in three and click submit, it understands it and it returns it. Let's try this in Internet Explorer. I'm not sure what version of Internet Explorer we have. Ah. We must have a version of Internet Explorer that doesn't support this. Let's look at the good news and the bad news here, because this is characteristic of all the HTML5 controls. The good news is, is that it didn't break. No smoke rose from the monitor, and I didn't get some big ugly error message. What did happen? What happened is, I got a plain old text box there. So the people that created HTML were pretty clever. If you put in an attribute that doesn't exist, it doesn't blow up. Like, unlike, say, C Sharp, where if you use some function that doesn't exist, or that exists in a later version of C Sharp than you're using, it doesn't freak out and blow up. It says, well, I'm HTML5, the browsers effectively say, well, I'm just going to ignore that. Well, if I don't know what a type number is, they must mean text box. So it treats it like a text box. So it doesn't break completely. 
The bad news, so that's the good news, that it doesn't break completely. The bad news is, is that we've lost that validation. So that's why for a while, until we can guarantee that everyone is running browsers that fully support HTML5 forms, we're going to have to do things the old way and the new way. That is, we're going to, we can use our HTML5 form controls, but we're going to still have to use JavaScript to validate them. All right, because we don't know what kind of browser the person's using on the other end. So, the good news is for the people that are using HTML5 browsers, they get some nice features. For the people that aren't using it, they don't get those nice features, but at least we can make it so that it doesn't break. All right. We would want to put validation in there because if you could imagine, if this were a ordering program and there was a null for a quantity, that would screw things up. All right, so we would want to put some sort of validation there to make sure that that didn't happen. So good news, bad news with this as far as browsers that don't support HTML5. It doesn't break completely, but we still have to treat them like text boxes and, and use the techniques that we would have used previously. That is validating using JavaScript. So I reviewed that with this. Everything I say from now on, the same thing applies for these other HTML5 controls. Let's look at some of the... So, so again, that doesn't mean don't use them, but if you use them, plan for what happens on a browser where you don't have those controls. And typically that involves writing JavaScript to do validation. Date's another field. Right? In HTML4, a text box was a text box. You could type anything you wanted in there. Letters, numbers, dates, times, whatever. With HTML5, you have an input type equals date. And depending on the specific browser, you can get a nice little feature that allows you to scroll through the dates. Or type them in. and then click Submit. Again, we do the same thing in Internet Explorer. We can type anything in, right, because it, it treats it like it's a text box, and it doesn't understand that, so it gives us a bogus value for our birthday. Yes? Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. So, so in other words, in, in HTML, in Internet Explorer, if the user plays by the rules and types in a legal date, Everything is fine. All right. We just don't have the form control enforcing that. So we'll have to enforce that either through our server side scripting or our client side JavaScript. Yeah, that's an excellent point. If they do it right, it'll work. Just like with the other one where, where we typed in a quantity. If they typed in a quantity here, In Internet Explorer, if they follow the rules and typed in a quantity, I think I used a different one, but you get the idea. It'll work. All right. I think this is the one I wanted number between 1 and 5. 
and I just There we go. If I play by the rules and type in a right quantity, it works. All right? We just can't guarantee on the form to do it, so we have to do it some other way. And that other way is either JavaScript or server-side script. So if there's an error, I mean, if it's wrong, it still gets submitted. So you, you could, and you can mess something up down the road. Like if, if somebody types in a report in 1802, that's sent someplace, it's not fetching it, and so somewhere down the road, that, that's the idea that screw up. Ex exactly. It has, uh, it has the potential to send invalid data if you use uh, a browser that doesn't support HTML5. Now, there's ways to keep that from happening. Through JavaScript, you can keep the form from submitting at all, so it won't send it to the server. Or you can have validation in your server-side code that says, hey, if someone enters in a date that's absurd, reject it and send them back an error message. All right. Um, and in reality, you probably will do both, believe it or not. It's one of those, like, wear suspenders and a belt. You know, you, you do both of the things to make sure that it's foolproof. Input type of color. Here's an interesting one. You can actually go in here and pick your favorite color. And again, you know, how valuable is that? Well, you could use that for styling a page. You know, what color do you want your text to appear? You could allow users to check that. Let's see how Internet Explorer handles that. Again, it defaults it to the hex code, and if you type in a hex code right, It works. The problem is, is that most people who do that aren't going to know to type in a hex code. A range is good. Now, this is one thing where this doesn't look to be supported well in Chrome even. Because what does this value mean? Is that a 7? Is that a 70? Is that a 7 million? You know, who knows? Well, the, the thing is, is with this control, this control attempts to do exactly that, where you can slide it to control something, but like in the case of, let's say if this were a volume control, then it would be obvious. This is the loudest, that's the quietest, and that's in the middle. But if this was, how good did you think our restaurant was, and you can rate it, you know, that doesn't show me the numerical value, and I guess in some cases that might be important. You know, like, do I want to put it there or there? Is it a 7 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10? The point is, is that in some browsers, the input type range can be displayed. It, it sort of bugs me that I don't see the actual numeric value. Well, yeah, but a user's not going to be looking at the HTML code. No, what I'm saying is people put that in your video. You would add that element. Let's say I want a five star, and that slider is going to slide from no stars to five stars. I would have to start placing it. Oops. Yes, but you, 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 you would need to do that via JavaScript to visually show that. 
month, week, these are just variants of the date one that we looked at. Email addresses. Oh, let's let's see what the slider does in HTML5. I have a feeling it's not going to be very good. Well, I already know the answer. What is the answer? It's going to display as a text box, right? In HM in it's going to display the same, really? Well, none of these other things have been working. Actually, it displays better in Internet Explorer. No kidding. Oh. Right, right. Well, again, that, and that's, yeah, daytime. <laughs> and, uh, you can use it, but it's never going to work on anything. What does that mean when you see that? What, you know, what, uh, that, that, that's seemingly an absurd situation. We have a feature, but it never works. Well, remember that the development of HTML5 and the development of browsers goes in parallel. It's not as though the HTML5 specifications are published, the world stops, and browser makers have two years to develop browsers that fully implement all the features. The specifications are developed, and they put out like draft specifications to say, this is what we're thinking of doing, this, that's what we're thinking of doing, and so on. And browser makers are putting out new versions of their browser based on a number of factors. Just plain marketing, right? Security issues. All sorts of things. They're putting out things. So there's a lot of factors that influences when an organization is going to release their browser. So they may not be done with that yet. So maybe if we came back in fall or spring semester, we might see something other than five X's. Oh, use the date time instead. All right, good. Uh, the input time is removed from the HTML standard. All right, so that's an even better explanation of why uh, it is. You see, reading actually helps you out quite a bit if you actually read the, the whole screen. You know what that means? And here's the interesting thing. At some point, this was part of the specification. So some programmer probably spent a lot of time at Microsoft implementing that in Internet Explorer or a Google Chrome programmer implementing it in Google Chrome. And then one day they turned around and said, nah, we're not going to use it anymore. So they had to go and take it out. All right? So there you go. You can't win no matter what is the bottom line. Telephone. URLs. I think you get the idea here. These things are more specialized versions of plain old text boxes. And for browsers that support them, you get a you know a a a, a, a better experience for the user. It it, it itself by its own without you having to do anything does some validation for you all right um, whereas if it's not implemented in a particular browser it acts like a text box and means it's up to you to implement it questions we have a uh, questions I have one that's yeah. related to drop boxes from earlier okay but um you talked about a drop box like two different options Okay. So those those are like link drop downs. In other words, what you're talking about is something like this. Let's 
say they don't have that. They don't have this on our site, and it's probably good because this would be kind of a clunky interface anyhow. But let's say you could pick the department for a class. So you could pick accounting, CISS, nursing, whatever. When you pick CIS, it would show you a list of the CISS courses. When you pick that, maybe it would show you the sections, day, evening, web, and so on. That's kind of what you're talking about, right? All right. How would you implement this? This would be implemented through, typically through JavaScript. All right? And it could be done one of two different ways in JavaScript. It could be done 100% in JavaScript, where everything, all this coding was done in JavaScript. Or it could be done using Ajax. All right? Um, Ajax is the client and server having a more rapid fire conversation than typically is done. Because typically, the client and server communicate in a very clunky way. The client makes a request, the server responds to it. Client does some things, makes another request, the server responds to it. With Ajax, a page can, in, in the old way, the way that I described, every request gets back a complete new web page. All right. In this case, we don't want to refresh the whole page each time. We just want to refresh this drop box, uh, drop down. Therefore, what you could do is you could make it so that as I change this, I make a call to the server that says, give me the list of classes for CISS, and then it gets back a list, and then JavaScript will populate that form. So that is Ajax, where the server and client communicate without reloading the entire page. Um, an example of that that you see a lot is Google with Google Search. I go in here. And I start typing. I type in H, it shows me the most popular searches that begin with H. All right, Home Depot, Hotmail, Huntington Bank, Howard Hanna. I type in HT, HTC, HTC1, MG, M9 rather, HTC1, HTML. I type in HTM, it shows me the most popular. Now if you think about this, Something funny's going on here, <laughs> all right, in a nutshell. Because the web page couldn't co possibly contain all of Google search terms, all right? You couldn't download a web page. It has to be getting that from a web server, all right? It has to be asking Google's web server, what are the four most popular searches that start with HTM? All right? And yet, this is not like the typical client-server interaction, whereas typically every time you request a page from a server, you get back a complete page. So what's happening here is Ajax. As I type in, a little mini request is sent to the server. The server responds back and JavaScript then finishes the population of the page. All right. At any rate, that's what you do in a case like that more than likely. You would have the drop-down populate with the top level of things. As you pick something, you'd make a little mini request to the server to say, give me the next level of things, and you just continue that down the line. All right, let me sketch out the rest of the semester, that is next week, <laughs> believe it or not. And 
for those, uh, I, I'm, I'm not one of those people that like to say, I told you so, but when I said start thinking about your project because the end of the semester comes fast, I told you so, <laughs> right? Okay. First of all, your project at this point is sort of job one. All right? You have everything you need to do to do your project, I think, unless you have some special things that you want to do all right, that we have not covered, which I can cover with you individually. So your project is sort of job one. and your lab assignments. And you should have everything you need to do to do these. All right. We're going to talk about two things next week depending on the time. Tables and JavaScript. Tables, we're going to talk about how they're used. I would not expect we would spend all of Tuesday talking about that. Not sure. I have to think about it, but we should cover this completely on Tuesday and we might have some time to talk about JavaScript. JavaScript is included in this class to give you a sort of a taste of the capabilities of what it can do. There's been a number of times throughout class where students have had questions and I've said you'd have to handle that via JavaScript. Well, to be fair and to sort of close the loop on some things, we spend a little bit of time talking about JavaScript. So even if you don't like understand it completely, at least you can maybe see how it fits in the picture. All right, and then uh, be a springboard for you to go and, and do some more um, advanced stuff with it, either by taking classes or reading on your own or whatever. Don't hesitate to bring any questions you have about your project or lab to class. But again, we can also talk about those during lab time. But that's what we'll do next week. I don't really feel like starting tables today because, you know, we just have maybe, we have 14 minutes. Um, I would rather give you extra time in lab to work on your project or ask questions about your project um, than than that. So I aim to do that also next week because that's important. I do not believe I posted the forms examples from last time. I will post them all this time and so you can take a look at the code for that. All right, we'll see you in lab.